Oh God, we come before you to offer thanksgiving, to offer praises, because we have a lot to be thankful for. We have much to be thankful for, for things that are seen and so many things that are unseen that affect our lives. We're thankful most of all for the relationship that we have with you through the sacrifice of your son, Jesus Christ. As we make the journey called life, open our eyes and our minds to your love and to your grace, but also to your expectation of each of us. You call us to a life of giving, a life of receiving, a life of humility, a life of victory, a life of holiness, a life of perfection. Search us in this time of worship and test the measure of our hearts. Holy Spirit, be the honored guest in this service, in these moments as we've gathered together and in our hearts. May every person that we meet be blessed by your Spirit. and May we be, Lord, a reflection of your Son, Jesus. We pray today that you would be with our world. We pray, Lord, that you would be with our, our country, our leaders. We need to humble ourselves before you once again and seek your face. I pray for the church family here and abroad, different places, not only the church family universal, but certainly those who are being persecuted and those who are here in the, body, the local body of Christ. I pray, O oh God, that you would minister to us and strengthen us, minister to our needs, minister to the needs of those who, in our missions group that we support. You know everyone, you know every need. We pray for the rice and beans. We pray, Lord, for inner light. We pray for ILI. We pray for saints in practice and, and blue water surrender and United Methodist Children's Home. We thank you that we can contribute something and help and encourage those who are doing these incredible ministries. Speak to us now and speak through us as we worship you today. We love you. We thank you for your faithfulness, that you care about every part of our lives. We thank you for all that you do. We thank you that you find us useful as imperfect as we are, and yet you call us to perfection. And so help us, lift us, strengthen us, minister to us in these moments as we worship you in Christ's name. Amen. If you could see what I once was If you could go with me Back to where I started from I know that you would see The miracle of love That took me in its sweet embrace and made me what I am today just a sinner saved by grace I'm just a sinner saved by grace I boast of anything 
I've ever seen or done How could I dare to claim as mine The victories God has won Where would I be had God not brought me Gently to this place I'm here to say I am nothing but a sinner saved by grace. I'm just a sinner saved by grace. When I stood condemned. This is not really an advertisement for the green turtle, and no, I didn't steal the cup. But, but it tastes good. I had the privilege one cold Thanksgiving weekend to hear Dr. Warren Wiersbe speak at Moody Bible Church in Chicago, and it was one of those windy city, windy cold. I can still remember the walk to the church. Dr. Wearsby once spoke of hearing another minister say, and I quote, most Christians are betweeners. That's a new word to me. Most Christians are betweeners. So he asked the minister, what does that mean? This was the answer. Most Christians are between Egypt and Canaan, out of danger but not yet in the place of rest and rich inheritance. He went on, they are between Good Friday and Easter Sunday, saved by the blood, but not yet enjoying newness of resurrection of life. Betweeners. Now, we all come into the world as a baby. I think you all did, right? You can't remember? Okay, you came into the world as a baby, but at some point we begin to mature, and it's tragic if we don't, of course. We love to hold and cuddle a baby, and sometimes we say, especially we have some older children, you know, we say, don't grow up, we love you just the way you are, but we don't really mean that. Uh, we want them to develop, and we want them to mature and grow, and God wants the same thing for his children. Now, I'm not going to ask you to raise your hand. I do that sometimes, but I will say that if I ask you how many of you really are quite familiar with the word sanctification, a lot of you wouldn't raise your hand. And if I said, well, define it for me, some hands would go down. And that's all right. I mean, there's so many justification, sanctification. Maybe it's not all right, but it happens. That's the way it is. So I titled this Sanctification and Holiness. And it's a little bit different. It's more teaching than preaching. A little bit different. But anyway, you, you, can, you, can, you can deal with it, okay? I want to read... Uh, from just, I actually have just one verse down, but let me read just a little bit more. 
Uh, Hebrews 6, 1a. But I'm going to start, let's see, uh, Hebrews 6, let's go back to 5, and I'll start reading just in the beginning of chapter, or verse 12 from Hebrews. And this is, most people believe that St. Paul wrote this, okay? Though by this time you ought to be speaking probably, to the, he's speaking to the church, so he could be speaking to us as well depending on where we are, what level we are. Though by this time you ought to be teachers, you need someone to teach you the elementary truths of God's word all over again. You need milk, not solid food. Anyone who lives on milk, being still an infant, is acquainted with the teaching about righteousness, but solid food is for the mature, who by constant use have trained themselves to distinguish good from evil. Now, this is the key verse, and I'm going to read just beyond it, but this is the key verse. Therefore, let us leave the elementary teachings about Christ and go on to maturity. And then it goes on to say, now laying again the foundation of repentance from acts that lead to death and of faith in God, instructions about baptism, the laying on of hands, the resurrection of the dead, and eternal judgment. We're all supposed to know about that already if we're followers of Christ. But he wants us to go beyond that. And then it says, and God permitting, we will do so. Now, in case some of you say, well, I never really heard that word, and it's always been, you know, I don't know what it means. Just, I want you to know that this isn't voodoo, and it's not heresy, and it's not some parachurch extreme teaching, okay? So I'm going to give you some, uh, just a little bit. Actually, it's in your, what I'm going to read first is in your outline. This is from the uh, Discipline of the United Methodist Church 102, Section 1, and it says sanctification and perfection. And this is what it says. We hold that the wonder of God's acceptance and pardon does not end God's saving work, which continues to nurture our growth in grace. Though the power of the Holy, through the power of the Holy Spirit, we are enabled to increase in the knowledge and the love of God and in love for our neighbor. New birth is the first step in this process of sanctification. Sanctifying grace draws us toward the gift of Christian perfection, which Wesley described as a heart habitually filled with the love of God and neighbor, and as having the mind of Christ and walking as he walked. The gracious gift of God's power and love, the hope and expectation of the faithful, is neither warranted by our efforts, can't do anything to, to get it, nor by, limited by our frailties. Now, that, take, that would probably cover a huge number of Protestant churches, but I thought, now what does the Catholic Church say about it? Are they on that same page? Here's what the Catholic Church says. The Catholic Church upholds the doctrine of sanctification, teaching that sanctifying grace is that grace which confers on our souls a new life that is sharing in the life of God for the individual. It is a close union, a close union with God and the resulting moral perfection. There are those words again that we, we say, well, we can't do that. Moral perfection. It is essentially of God by a divine gift. Okay. So now I'm not lost out there in the woods making up something. All right? <laughs> I wouldn't do that anyway. When I talk about the church, the family of God, the bride of Christ, I consistently endeavor to minimize the differences that we have with other denominations and maximize our mission. I think every church should do that. But of course, there are some, a few denominational differences, and we, we believe, I, I think even in what we believe about sanctification and perfection, some that would set us apart, but not a lot. Now, I don't spend a great deal of time preaching Christ's experience. I believe the crisis is unique to every person and every believer as we grow in Christ, as we attempt to grow in Christ. In other words, there's not a cookie-cutter theology. We don't, we're not cookie-cutter Christians. I mean, I think there are groups that you, they preach a certain thing and everyone has to be just like that and you have to line up a certain way. That's, I don't believe that. Uh, I believe some people arrive at perfection, sanctification, holiness, uh, without even knowing it. They don't even know the mechanics. They don't know the theology. They don't know the correct terms. They just know that they pray and they grow in Christ. And maybe there comes a day where they say, Lord, I just need more of you. Just bless me and help me to go to the next step in my life. So my desire, my challenge always is to preach where you live. I hope you 
have discovered that by now, encouraging you to live out holy lives, moment by moment. Okay, Pastor, you started out talking about sanctification, but you also have the word holiness. The title, of course, included both words. So what's that all about? Sanctification and holiness translate the same, or nearly the same. Sanctification describes the process to holiness. Sanctification translates from the the Latin sanctus, uh, holy, or holiness, It is the work of the Holy Spirit that sets us apart and enables us to obey, to be obedient, and to be faithful. It begins initially when we come to Christ, when we when we bend the knee, or when we're baptized, or whenever that whatever that point is where we actually make a commitment to God. And from that moment, there is a growth process that will bring us to a crisis experience. We may not even recognize it as a crisis experience, but it's it's some point where we say, "Oh, I love you, Lord, but I need more of your power." I need more of you to to be a better person. Something like that, okay? Well, pastor, that sounds interesting. Never heard it quite that way before. Okay. I think that all mainline evangelical churches, mainline and evangelical churches, teach that there is a need for a deeper walk. However, uh, one group says, you know, this denomination over here will say, I'm a Christ follower, but... I, I, we would all say that. I guess I, I'm a Christ follower. I got ahead of myself. I'm a Christ follower, but, but I desire to know you better. We all say that. Uh, hopefully, I feel so weak and ineffective. I want to be a better Christian. I desire to have greater faith and a deeper walk. Okay. One group uses, one denomination uses the word sanctification. But you go over to another one and they say, they use the terms a closer union with God. And then you go to another group. And they talk about being fully consecrated to God. When you're fully consecrated to God, that's your part, and God then will do his part. Then others talk about a crisis experience, and some use the word filled with the Spirit, and another would say, you arrive there by speaking in tongues. You see, there's all these different groups, and they're all talking about something very similar. My point is, every believer will come to a point, if they read their Bible and pray and want to grow in Christ, maybe some people never do, but every believer will come to a point where they realize I just need more of you, Lord. I just want to walk in the light. I want to be faithful to you. I don't want to fail you. I need more of you. I want to know you better. Okay? So that's kind of my opening statement there. Let's just pray. Thank you, Lord, that we have tasted of the good things of God. We've come into your family, and we love you, and we thank you for your grace. But help us now to go beyond sins forgiven to a life of godliness and holiness. And once again, I may be speaking to the choir here because these people, we all love you, Lord, but we all want to grow in Christ. And even if there's one person that is encouraged or helped this morning, then it will be worth these moments together. Okay, if you listen closely, you may not know these names, but if you listen closely, you're going to pick up some of Dr. John Oswald or Dr. Dennis Kinlaw or Dr. Marlon Hodel this morning because I've learned more from these guys uh, than I did in seminary and college. Of course, they all taught in seminary and college, but I've had the privilege of, of connecting with them over the years. Now, let's think about some significant facts. We'll begin with facts and Maybe after Father's Day, I'll come back with some distinctions and some expressions, okay? First of all, important truths or facts. Now, again, your, your, uh, your uh, outline is not quite right. I proofed it, but I didn't proof it close enough. So, <laughs> uh, Number one, sanctific- you can just, out, uh, in the outline, one and two, you can just scratch the truth and the line there on the left. And just start with this. Sanctification is critical to spiritual growth if you're filling that out. Sanctification is critical to spiritual growth. We're all called to be holy. Now, if you believe that there are just a few super-Christians and the rest of us are just forgiven and we don't have any influence, that's not true. Uh, You're reading some other version if you believe that because that's not what the Bible teaches. God calls all of us. Now, I realize that some of us are up here and some of us feel like we're down here. I don't do much, but we all do something in the kingdom. Sometimes we act as if the Bible is limited only to the New Testament. And if you read the New Testament and you don't read it, you know, too closely, you might get the idea that salvation is simply saved from, listen, guilt and condemnation. No. If you read the Old Testament, not carefully, you see that salvation is more than just being forgiven from guilt and condemnation. We're children of the Reformation, and maybe we think the Christian faith began there. Or perhaps we think it started in the first century. 
If you look through the pages of the Old Testament, you discover that all through the Old Testament, there was a hunger for holiness and godliness among the early Bible characters. If you read the heart of David over and over in Psalm, for example, he says, Oh God, you are my God. I shall seek you earnestly. My soul thirsts for you. For you, I wait all the day long. And that's the cry of his heart over and over. And this is a guy who committed some deep sins, but God called him, you know, uh, a man after my own heart because he so much wanted to please God. See, salvation is not only to be freed from the guilt and the condemnation of sin, but also from the power. Now, why did Jesus come to cleanse the temple? You remember when that happened? Threw all those guys out so he could take up residence. Why sanctification? So that God the Holy Spirit would come in, the full, in fullness into our lives and take up residence. So that's number one. Number two, sanctification comes by faith, just like our salvation, our walk with God. John Wesley, in the early days, was a good example of the problem of the Christian tradition. Through the years, Christians have sought to be holy and perfect and mature because the Bible tells us to, but all too often, we try to do that in our own strength, and we can't do that. We're flesh. We can't do that. John Wesley was on board. I, 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 anyway, I, I think that he might have been a bit of the problem to begin with. John Wesley was on board a ship bound for Savannah. Saint, if you've ever been to St. Simons or Fort, uh, Fort Frederica or, or Savannah or uh, all that area along the coast, he came in. Uh, I think he came in actually to meet Oglethorpe, or maybe he came with Oglethorpe. But anyway, so it's right along the Georgia coast. And when they're on the ship... He met the Moravians. Now, the Moravians were faithful Protestant German Christians, very devout. And during a worship service aboard the ship, a life-threatening storm comes. And some of you have probably been in, in those because you've, you've been in the water enough to know and the, the waves break over the ship again and again and, and finally the, the, the mainsail is broken and it splinters and there's this terrible fear and screams break out among the English. Among the English uh, crying, weeping, afraid, and scared. The Moravians sang. The Moravians were calm. So following the storm, Wesley asked one of the Moravians, were you not afraid? And the response was, I thank God, no. We weren't afraid. But weren't the children and the women afraid? No, our women and children are not afraid to die. Well, I know we all, we're never going to not have some fear, of course. But when you're in Christ... And you know what the next step is. You know what the next world is. You shouldn't have a lot of fear. Following that, for the next two years, he struggled with that. And uh, all the time he was in Georgia, he worried uh, by the thought that he didn't know if he really had faith in God like he should. And you go back to the question that I've asked you, can I trust God? Now we say glibly, of course, I come every Sunday, I trust God. Do you really? There will be experiences in your life that will help you to know if you really trust God. You'll come up against something, and then you'll know. I trust God. I believe God. I believe there's a heaven. I believe this is all real. Or you just fall apart. In the evening of Wednesday, most of you, well, Methodists, a lot of you aren't Methodists, though, but a lot of Methodists would know this. In the evening of Wednesday, May the 24th, 1738, Wesley went, and it was interesting, he went unwillingly. Any of you come to church this morning unwillingly? <laughs> he went unwillingly to a society, like a Bible study in Aldersgate Street, where one was reading Luther's preface to the book of Romans. About a quarter before nine, while he's describing the change, they're describing the change which God works in my heart and yours through faith in Christ. There are those famous words that every, almost every believer would have heard somewhere. He said, I felt my heart strangely warmed, and I felt I did trust Christ. Wow, that was the moment. And his life changed dramatically. And if you study his life, then after that he was fearless. That night the seed that would become Methodist and Methodism was planted. Now let's think about another great church leader that I, I already mentioned, and that's Martin Luther. A man of God, professor of theology at the university. Very bright guy. Priest, author, composer, monk, but... With all his brilliance and all his knowledge, he struggled, and he doubted. I'm not good enough. Now remember, he's got all this theological training, and he's a, a theology professor, but 
Have I worked hard enough to be accepted? He tried to be good. He suffered depression over the issue. He even flogged himself at times, trying to make himself submissive, something that they did something more in those days. He still feels condemned, and he doesn't feel worthy. Do you feel worthy? You're not. Don't worry, you don't, have, don't, don't worry about feeling worthy, because you're not. But one day he read in the Bible something he no doubt had read many times before, and that's why you need to read it over and over and over again, because you get something new all the time. And it connected, and this was it, this was it, Ephesians 2, 8 and 9, which says, For it is by grace, it is by grace you have been saved through faith, and this not of yourselves, it's a gift of God. Not by works, so no man can boast, not by flogging yourself, not by trying to do good deeds. By the way, we're not saved by his love. We're saved by mercy and grace of God. So, if we made it to heaven in, with our good deeds and our good works, we would most likely be subject to the most boring and disgusting monologues, all three turned about description of the good deeds that this person did to get through the pearly gates. This is what I did. Yeah, but this is what I did. I visited the nursing home every day. Yeah, but big deal. I made stained glass windows for the church two days a week. I kept the pastor stuck, uh, you know, uh, stocked up on fresh fish and bluebell ice cream. Now that one is a little bit more important. <laughs> See, the light comes on to Luther, and the Reformation follows. The five pillars of the Reformation. Grace alone, faith alone, Christ alone. That's usually what we do, but there are actually more. Glory of God alone, and then the Latin solo scriptura means scripture alone. Grace alone, faith alone, Christ alone, glory of God alone, and Scripture alone. Wesley had the same struggle that, that uh, Luther had. Good works, how good is enough? Some of us do that too. Don't, don't do your good works to try to earn somehow, you know, I'll be better, you know, I'll be sanctified, for example, or I'll be holy. No, you do the good works because you're a child of the king and you want to. And I see that in your hearts. I can just see the heart of people sometimes who say, how's this person doing? Do they need food at their house? Do they? Just the little things like that. Now, now, we'll give you this, and it's probably something you really don't need, but it's all right. One or two of you might like to hear it. Here, there's a difference between Luther and Wesley, and I told you I'm teaching, not preaching, but here's where Le Luther and Wesley part company. Luther says, if we're saved by grace through faith, then we're seen by God as being holy, seen by God. But we really aren't. He goes on to say righteousness is imputed to us. In other words, God looks at us through, in the words of Oswald, uh, Dr. Oswald, God looks at us through Jesus-colored glasses. And he says, Bob is sinning, but I see him through Jesus, so I see him as holy. Wesley says this, it's not going to make any difference if you're a follower of Christ, which one you believe. But Wesley did not accept that interpretation. He said, thank God, I am saved by grace. And then he says something that resonates with me. All the words of Scripture that call me to share his character, share his purity, share his love, his righteousness, as his holiness, and his perfection, I must be there for a reason. Make sense? Must be there for a reason. Hmm. God must really intend that I be righteous and holy and clean. We're saved by faith, but we're also made holy by faith. And, and you're made holy when you come to Christ. I'm not, if, you, if you don't feel like you've grown like you want to, you're still holy. But there's a holiness of heart that, that can come into our lives and help us to go deeper in Christ. It's not imputed, it's imparted. God makes us truly righteous, holy, pure, and clean, not by works, but by faith. Now, Wesley and Luther say sanctification is by faith, but the Lutheran tradition says we're not really righteous, we're just seen as righteous. Wesleyan doctrine says we're really made righteous, and it is by faith. Either way, you believe that. If you serve the Lord faithfully, don't go home and worry about it. <laughs> So you don't come to church so the pastor can stir you up to work harder. That will enable you to be more holy because that won't make you more holy. The holiness comes from within and comes from above. The light comes on for Luther and there's a reformation. The light comes on for Wesley and Methodism begins to travel all around the world. 
Okay, number three, sin is a matter of actions and disposition. I almost like to skip through this, but I, I must not. A godly life avoids sinful acts and a sinful mind. I may, be, I may do good works on the outside, but if my heart is not his, I have not been delivered from the dominion of sin. Wesley cried out for his heart to have a righteous disposition. The Bible says you must be saved, you, you must turn your back on sin. That's external. It also says that be righteous and holy. That's internal. We're, we're dealing with the human character. Sin is actions and disposition. Now listen, God could deal with the, the acts of sin and the disposition of sin at the same time. I'm sure of that because there's nothing impossible with God. But why doesn't he do that? Because we don't know our own needs when we come to Christ. If I'm baptized or if I kneel at the altar and say, come into my life, Lord Jesus, forgive me for my sins, that's where we are. Normally when a person comes to Christ for salvation, they're really thinking about condemnation and guilt. We pray, oh God, deliver me from the guilt of sin, and he does it, and we say, I've been forgiven. I'm a Christian. We begin to live for Christ. The acts of sin have been dealt with. But soon we begin to discover they got this little three-year-old kid inside that says, no, I don't want to do it that way. No, I'm mad. I want my way. I, don't tell me what to do. That's the little guy inside. And we say, but I love you, Lord. Why, what's that thing in there? Uh, what's that about? Uh, then we come up against the disposition. Now, deep within, I discover a wall or a nature of enthroned self. You know that it's all about me? It's a critical point. What do I do? Well, I sure like this Christian thing for a while, but it's not so great. You know, I have a lot of temptation, and I can't love God the way I thought I could. And those first days and weeks, that's pretty good, pretty awesome, but I don't know. I don't know about this Christian thing. That's the second moment of grace when God says, Child, Bob, you don't have to live there. You can't change, but I can. I can change your disposition. Sin is a matter of actions and disposition. Now, Oswald Chambers says, sanctification means being made one with Jesus so that the disposition that ruled him will rule me. God wants to change my disposition. I hope he has. Every once in a while, I'm, I'm in real heavy traffic, and I think, wait a minute, what are you doing down there? <laughs> What's going on here? (laughs) Okay, number four. Sin is a matter of imperfection and intention. In one sense, it's true that sin is any deviation from God's perfection. And and it's for sort of a Calvinistic position. And it's it's not a bad position, but... Wesley said it this way, I may think more highly of someone than I ought to, and, and if I do... I've sinned, or, you know, it's a de- in other words, anything that I do that's not perfect, that's a deviation from God's perfection. God knows the person that I'm thinking about perfectly, and, and if I've estimated that person more highly or more lowly than he or she deserves, then in a sense, I'm imperfect, so I've sinned. So in one sense, sin is a matter of any imperfection, and no one achieves sinlessness in that sense. Somebody asked John Wesley, though, if you have been delivered from the disposition of sin, then why do you pray the Lord's Prayer? Forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. I mean, after all, you don't trespass, right? You don't have any trespasses to, you know. This is what he said. In the sense that I fall short of God's perfection, I need his atoning blood every moment of every day. Now, sin is a matter of imperfection, any deviation from God's perfect will. Now, I don't feel a compulsion to close my prayers, all of my prayers, like some people do. Forgive me, O God, I have sinned in thought, word, and deed. Unless I've done, when we go to the next level here. On the other hand, I might occasionally say, if I failed you today in any way, forgive me. I want to be sure that my, my relationship is right with you. Now, this is the part that's most important, I think. Wesley says, Sin, rightly so called, is a transgression of the known law of God in a willful manner. That's sin. That's the sin that I, I have to be concerned about. Willful transgression. Okay? What's, what is that? If you cheat on an exam in high school or college or at the license branch for that matter, that's willful transgression. Okay? If I commit adultery, willful transgression. I knew what I was doing. 
If you're invited for dessert at my house and you eat all the bluebell ice cream, that's shameful, but it's not willful transgression. However, if you break in while I'm away and you take all my ice cream, that's willful transgression. Don't do it. We may, actually, we will serve God imperfectly in the flesh, okay? We know we will. But the intention of my heart can be pure. The intention of my heart is holy toward God. Paul says it beautifully, this one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forth unto, uh, unto the things which are before, I press on. Wow. Of course, Paul, he was always talking, he talked a good bit about running and finishing the race, and he was a bit of an athlete, I think, or at least an athletic, uh, very interested in athletics. An intention that is pure. A non-Christian is pretty much controlled by their past. A Christian looks to the future constantly. So, sin is a matter of imperfection and intention. That's the part, that's, that's, where, I'm, that's where my concern lies. So what does that mean practically? Well, on the one hand, I cannot say I am sinless and perfect like God. That would be silly. On the other hand, I don't have to live with a guilty conscience saying, I sin daily in thought, word, and deed, unless you do, unless you know that you have. In other words, you don't have to ask God to forgive you for something that you're not aware that you've... Some people would argue with me about that, but that's all right. I don't apologize for something that I don't know about other than just to say, if I failed you in any way, Lord, forgive me. Show me what it is. I'll be glad to make it right. We can live with a clear conscience, knowing that he purifies our heart. He knows my heart. He knows the intentions of my heart. He knows when, it, when I am completely his. He knows when I'm pure, when I'm holy, and my desires are right. There's a song. See if I have time for this. We're going to do it anyway. There's a song <laughs> that we often sing that speaks to this verse and this issue. It's about a Christian, a believer asking God to sanctify, to make holy his heart. This is a Christian, but it's making making me holy. And the song is, open the eyes of my heart, Lord, that I may see you. Open the eyes of my heart. I'm a follower of Christ, but open the eyes of my heart. I want to see you in your fullness. Now, this is a very special rendition because some of you may have seen this, but I play this, I want to play this. It's a very special rendition because of the one who is singing. And if you're listening to this uh, on, on uh, YouTube or website, uh, and, and, and uh, we're not able to put it on because I don't know if we can, you can just go to Safari and pull the name up, Christopher Duffley. So go ahead and uh, play that uh, hobby. I couldn't watch that the first two or three times without a few tears. If I gave you too much to bite off this morning, uh, just tell the Lord, I want to be holy, holy, holy. That's what we want. And uh, I want to see you. I want to see you. By the way, the little guy has perfect pitch. I don't know if you noted that perfect pitch when he was about four years old. Father, open the eyes of my heart and every heart that wants to see you and and please you and reflect your love to the world. A world that knows little about the love that you have for your creation. You love everything you created, you love every person you created, and you have a special kind of love for your children. We want to be holy vessels to live the sanctified, holy life. In other words, we want all of you, and we want you, Lord, to have all of us. And we offer ourselves today by faith and by your grace, and we love you. Let's stand together. Set us apart, O God, to be a channel through which you offer healing and nourishment to the body and to the mind and to the spirit. 
and God bless you. I think we can agree that Bob in his fatherly way has told us all we need to grow up, <laughs> at least in Christ, right? And um, I think he would also agree that that doesn't happen when you feed yourself once a week. And what we do as we grow as Christians is learn to feed ourselves. And that comes with that daily walk with the Lord. This song is a, a response to that. How are we going to live? And this by uh, Gloria Gaither. Bless you. Have a good week.